We're on the last one, and I'm slowly seeing you guys trickle in, so I like taking my time at the start here. This one's going to be a bit of a shorter episode. I'll be able to slow down a little more. I know I'm throwing like a fire hose of content into you. Appreciate you guys for giving me as much of your attention as you can, but I promise you're going to leave out with this better than you started. So commercialized prayers. I was stewing for the longest time on Twitch. What did I want to do for this video? And I thought for the background picture, why don't I put a copy of me up there shilling my book? Because that's also commercialized. It's a little bit of a self-aware tongue-in-cheek thing. Whatever is what it is. Welcome, guys. Last episode for the day. If you're not watching us at home, it's episode 8 on The Manipulated Man by Esther Villa, the 1930s feminist who did a 1970s turn to the MRA, the starts of the MRA space. That's right. Disenfranchised feminists started the MRA. MGTOWs are stealing their talk points. Everything stemmed from one German chick. Just makes you think. What kind of a man I am if I'm going my own way, if that one way was developed by an old German girl. Especially one that was like a teenager in the 40s. I don't know. Anybody who was at their formative years in the 40s got all of their information from that age? I don't know if I can trust them. You know what I mean? Anyways commercialized prayers we're gonna go over uh lying and game theory how everyone does it doesn't work everybody's gullible it doesn't work so it needs to be a rare thing that's how she describes it at the beginning is that lies uh guys in general need to be honest because honesty allows the machine to work it allows cooperation allows things to move forward lies can damage that and if everybody lies then nothing gets done so ideally, lies should be considered as rare. And the more lying that you have in a society, the more devalued human interaction is. And that's a concept, I think they call it, um, uh, not social credit, but how trustworthy a society is, is how well it runs. They had like, an, uh, the, the marker they used was, how likely were you as a parent to let your kids go on their own, to go to the store, get a thing of ice cream and come home without any supervision? And that level was what they considered like the societal trust level of society. And it's gone in the just it, the tanker. It's gone. We don't have it anymore. People are afraid. Like when I was a kid, there was a, most people didn't lock their doors. And now people consider you stupid if you aren't dead bolting them. It's just the way it is. That way it is now. So it's not very trusting. It's kind of annoying. Um, so lies and game theory. On this point... What they're referring to, again, it's like a prisoner dilemma. Are you willing to lie to somebody and get your way? Or are you willing to honest, be honest and lose something out on it? It's not the prisoner's dilemma, but I can't remember the name of it. But that's the idea. So if you both lie, then you both lose. If one of you lies, then one of you wins and one of you loses, but you win a lot. If you're both honest, then both of you win, but just a little bit. So it's all about a cooperation thing. And then she makes the argument that women lie as a state of being, Men, because of the way we respect our institutions, want to be honest as a state of being. And that this whole system won't work unless every guy is gullible and every girl is Machiavellian or everybody is honest. Not sure what we can do about that other than navel gaze. Just be aware. Assume the other person is lying until they tell you otherwise. That's the game theory part of it. Tit for tat. You can even be altruistic if you want on that first thing. Give one person, give them an opportunity to screw you over. And then you switch over to the uh, lying strategy. Yeah, be home when the streetlights come on. Exactly. Those are the old days. Uh, so what did I put here? So the female ideal is towards it for men. Oh, okay. So the idea of deception is the female ideal is to be 100% deceptive and still get everything you want. The idea that it never comes back to bite you in the ass. And everything about women that they say and they do stems from their ego. And that's the idea. Men, although she makes the argument that men need to adopt a more dishonest facade on them. Now, I would argue that can work when you're doing tit for tat strategies. Wait for somebody to screw you over and then don't give them anything until they give back. And then you start working that out again. You can look that up online. I'm not going to rehash game theory here. But the one thing she misses out on it, and this lets you know that she's a female attempting to understand the male condition and she fails miserably at it. For a man, you don't have to lie. Like, you just don't. But at the same time, verbal intercourse is optional. This is probably one of my favorite articles from the Married Red Pill. And I'm going to put it up right now in chat so you guys can see what I'm talking about. I'm going to add it to the description so you can come by afterwards and see what I'm talking about. 
So if you're watching this video six months from now, you'll know what the heck is going on. Save that. I love this one. So the matters we discuss here are all about our creating sexual options by becoming a better man. Better in the sense that's better for you. It is about developing the mindset of abundance and embracing the fact that you have control over your life if you put in the work. It's also realizing that your wife has uh, similar control. To rehash everybody's favorite example, your wife has control over whether or not she's receptive to your want for sexual intercourse, aka smashing. You may be married and share in some vows, but you simply do not own her body. If you initiate and she gives you a hard no, you back off and play it cool. It's just how it works. So this journey is not about forcing anybody to do anything they don't want to do. Quite the contrary, you only control yourself and your job is to make sure that you put her in a position where saying no is such an unfathomable thing that she wouldn't dare. But there is some good news for you on all this one. The rules of control work both ways. And he's saying, the advice you should give when you first start out is to tell the guys to shut up. STFU, standard advice, because you may not gain anything from it, but you lose out from it. And he uses an example here of how verbal intercourse is optional. If a girl wants validation, if a girl wants communication, if a girl wants to talk, it's optional. And the idea of you saying, no, I don't want to talk, and then leaving and having her hound you around the house to talk about it is the equivalent of you walking around with an erection, chasing her around the house, begging her to go down on you. Once guys kind of understand that, they, they start to understand, oh, okay, so yeah, girls control sex, but I control me. And it's like a wonderful skill. And that's the thing. Transactional. Life is transactional. And that's okay. It's part of the human condition. Monkeys trade berries for sex. In your case, you're trading sexual desire for validation and your uh, attention, your affection, and your commitment. This is a currency you can deal with. This is a currency that's being valued. This is a currency that the other person values. You value sex much more than a woman values sex. But... A woman values validation, commitment, attention, and affection much more than you ever will. So everybody can come out ahead just so long as both you guys are making sure you're getting what it's worth. And for most guys, they don't. And that's why they end up in bad situations. But again, Esther doesn't mention any of that. She just talks about how women can lie with a clear conscience. They are not involved in the process of work, so their lies will only harm one person, usually the husband. What she's referring to there is that Let's say, for example, you're in the military and you lie while you're in the military. It causes harm to the military and harms the entire organization. Meanwhile, for a woman, she doesn't care about working, according to Esther here, absolute savage. She lies. One person suffers. I can live with that. It's like the trolley problem. Would you rather hit the switch or not hit the switch and have it run over five people or hit the switch and have it run over one? Well, girls decide to have it run over one. And guys, I think if you've seen it already from my latest blog post, guys end up being that one. So the guy trolley problem needs to be, would you rather have five people killed by not touching the train or would you hit the switch and have it kill you? And that how that's how it maps to here. So go back and read that one. It's the latest post on my blog. You can't miss it. Uh, da -da. And so it harms one person, usually the husband. And if it's not discovered, then it's no lie at all. It's just feminine guile. The only crime that does not come under this heading is physical unfaithfulness, which a man will not forgive. And I would argue that's a little bit outdated because guys have such thirst, such scarcity. They're so worried about not being able to tuck their kids at night that they're willing to forgive all kinds of stuff, including this. Now, of course, women would never openly forbid a man to lie. They simply associate lying with repugnance. Again, women only have as much power as you give them here in your life. They only, you only, you have to opt into your own suffering. And that's the thing. It's not the cheating that's bad. It was the lying. And that's the idea that lying was so bad that that's why the divorce is happening, not that you're cheating. Again, they tie it to repugnance. Anything that's not masculine, well, just man up and be honest. I won't be mad, just say it. See that? It's all based on either appealing to your thirst over girls, your fear of abandonment, or your no inner mobility as a man. Or nobility, sorry, not mobility. All this stuff. Look at that. We need that big dick energy. So once you understand how manipulative all this stuff is, you can free yourself from it, and it's super easy. Understand that these consequences are all bullshit. They don't exist. Nobody has them. These are all thinly veiled, implied threats, but there is no follow-through. 90% of the time, unless there's a legal statute in place, but even then, laws are only as, as uh, good as their enforcement. 
And you wouldn't believe how many laws out there exist. Now, I'm not suggesting to break the law. Far from it. Follow the law to the letter, boys. That's my official statement here. Hypothetically speaking, though, if there's a law that has zero enforcement, it's literally encouraging dishonest people to break the law and honest people not to break the law. So at this point, it's the same thing. Lying only works if half the people are gullible and half the people are vindictive or half the people are manipulative. It's game strategy side here. So if people are going to break this law anyway with impunity, then it behooves you to also do so because the only way these things get corrected is when the costs of not enforcing them become higher than the cost of enforcing them. I think there's a Zizek article on this. If you check it out, it's on RSA Animate. I want to say it's first as tragedy, then as farce, but he makes the case for how Starbucks is making it worse for free trade coffee. The idea that you buy a Starbucks coffee and it's just a coffee, but people feel guilty because I'm spending $5 on a coffee. So what Starbucks has done is they said, just so you know, every dollar you put into us goes to free trade people. So the peasants get their normal thing. We support all these causes. And the idea of the redemption over your guilt of consumption comes along with the product as a package. It allows you to feel better about things. And a lot of people do this. Again, another example from this from a consumer standpoint is masks. They have this passive aggressive mask that's out now basically crapping on people with masks. Masks are ineffective. I hope you feel safe now. This isn't doing anything. But they're still masks. And you buy the mask and you wear the mask. And then people are just thrilled by it because you get that feeling of vindication over, that's right, masks aren't effective, but you're still wearing a mask. Again, this is how you can't be, and this is like a very common problem guys fall into and that they treat all this manipulation as bad, but they'll spout off the rules. Well, Technically, because of Rolo's article on page seven, it says you're supposed to be doing this. I know what tragedy, I know what thoughtery you're up to, and I know this, and I know that. And they love to talk about how smart they are. There's a great article on this one in the Red Pill. I'll see if I can pull it up while I'm talking about you. It's about don't spout the rules. Ooh, don't spout the rules, play the game. Again. Nobody talks about this one because nobody online is damn red-pilled. Ah, oh, there she is. I had to grab it from an archive, but that's fine. So this is where we're going with this one. I'll put it in the chat so you guys can see it there. And I'm going to add it to the description in here. So what is this about? This is about a basketball game as a metaphor. Playing a basketball game. Uh... You're sitting there, the guy's fouling you. Well, he cross-dribbled there, so that was definitely a foul. That's why he did this. Or he checked this guy, should have got a foul, but the ref wasn't looking, and that's why he got two points up on us. And this guy sitting there during a basketball game, spouting out all the rules and showing why he's losing. Meanwhile, the other team's just crushing him. This is the exact same thing as arguing with a feminist online or arguing with thoughts online or any of this or bitching with your wife because you won't do anything or wearing a mask that says masks don't work or Nirvana when he went on the cover of Rolling Stone with corporate magazines suck, but he's still on the cover of it. Like, do you see what I mean? It's this psychological system. And again, Last Psychiatrist has a great article on it, but I've already linked enough to here. I'm sure I've had it talked about in other ones. It's Hipsters on Food Stamps Part 3, where that idea of getting somebody angry allows them to act within a system. Oh, it's not the hipsters article. It's a different article. It allows them to act within that system, but have the certain amount of emotional distance to do it ironically, which is a damn evil thing. And it's, I would argue it's not even a male problem. It's a human problem. It's a marketing one. If I can remember the title of that article, I'll put it up in this other one, but that's essentially it. So understand this by getting you angry at the whammon, you just spouting off this stuff as a cathartic PowerPoint MGTOW channel allows you to opt into the system without actually feeling like you've opted into the system. You have an emotional distance from it, and that's not what we want to do. So that's why I argue the anger phase is something you need to get out of. The anger phase is good. In this sense, it allows you to drive yourself to action. It increases your neuroplasticity, allows you to adopt new mental models to act in new self-interested ways. But once you're there, you don't need the anger phase anymore because an anger phase will then turn against you and allow you to opt into systems that you don't like. Like, that'll be the guy who's red-pilled, but he still goes and gets married because he thinks that's the best way of doing things. And he's, I'm red-pilled enough to handle it. And then she cheats on you, and you're like, oh, but that's fine. Rolo's article told me it was going to happen. It's a very self-defeating, emotionally distanced issue that you really shouldn't do. Again, 
Act ruthlessly in your own self-interest. And if you want to give up your altruism, it's a gift. And if other people aren't giving you their greatest enthusiasm or their altruism, you're wasting it on those people. Uh, last part she talks about here that I think is applicable. So only one circumstance in a man's life will ever make him tell a lie. And that is when he, as a result of pent up desire, has slept with another woman, although he clearly loves his own wife. He's so afraid of the possible consequences, she might go to the same thing herself, that he will suffer the most agonizing pangs of conscience rather than admit the truth. But if he has merely smashed up the car and maybe even killed somebody in the process, if he's behaved treacherously towards somebody else or taken a day off from work, he would rather clear his conscience and tell her. Again, modern things don't map well to this. Guys have this thing where as soon as they feel guilty, they offload the guilt onto the woman as a sense of absolutism. She's become his Catholic confession. Putting that leadership role on a woman is a guaranteed way to cause untold suffering in your life. Kill attraction. And it... Like, these are the same kind of guys who talk about emotional stoicism. Like, if you go so far as to do something reprehensible and you can't own the consequences yourself, then you shouldn't have done it. Don't do it. From a sexual strategy standpoint, if you're the kind of guy who does cheat on a girl, but you love her and you love the kids and you're past it, if you feel really bad about that, you just fix the problem. If you don't feel bad about it, then you own the consequences. But under no circumstance should you be going, I, should, I say should, but it does not work as a strategy to be honest and upfront about it and throw it in her face in order to absolve yourself of guilt. Because then you're asking for her for forgiveness so that everything you did was okay. Like how morally squishy do we have to be when we do this? Like, no, if you did something and you considered it morally wrong, then you get guilt. And you're supposed to have guilt. A guilt is your internal way of directing your behavior to a way that's interesting for you. Again, master and slave mentality. The master does what's good for him. And that internal sense of guilt is what drives him away from behavior that he doesn't like. As opposed to the slave or shame. Things that good people can do is now vilified. And things that he's forced to do are now a virtue. It's all about putting the onus on other people for your life. Or letting life happen to you. Again, she misses out on all of this stuff. But again, 50 years ago, a feminist chick talking about this stuff. Of course, she's going to get a bunch of it wrong. But that's it for this one. So we've had five, six, seven, and eight. We're going to have another two days with this or another eight chapters to go through. Thank you for catching out this long. Don't forget to hit the like button. Subscribe if you like this content. We'll see more. And if you're here on Friday, we're having the Patreon Q&As. Come on in. It's five bucks a month. We sit in there, we talk locker room stuff, we don't do the language filter thing. We do a very discreet, yet very unfiltered male sexual strategy. We'll deal with everything. We've dealt with divorce, with infidelity, with cheating, with guys that were worried about taking the innocence of their girl. Like all those problems that guys have, but they can't discuss in polite society, we spend it there. And it's not just me running my mouth to you. All those other guys in there all have a piece of the puzzle. So imagine going to a place where you have I think right now we're at 250 guys, 250 guys, all swapping notes amongst each other, all talking about their problems, all sorting it out without any female influence, zero simping, zero feel good measures. It's there and it works. And if you haven't been there, I suggest you try it out. I don't charge till the end of the month. So come in early, come in like first week of the month, try it out for three weeks and I guarantee you you'll like it and you'll stick around. But, uh, Send out the invites. Oh, do you not have an invite? Okay, yes, yeah, so that's the other thing. I have invites for the locker room, which is the forum that we can have so we can deal with this stuff away from just me running it on YouTube and that. Uh, every month for all the paid members I put it in is kind of reward for sticking it out. So I'll take a look. I'm not sure why some of them got missed. I thought I did for this month though, but I'll do some troubleshooting. We'll get to that. On this note though, I'll catch you guys on the next one. Take care. Talk about loyalty. The dog's sleeping here right beside me this whole time. He gets up every time I move the chair. Are you okay? Is murderer coming in? I don't know. Don't worry, buddy. I got your back. Anyways, guys. You rock. Somebody's in here telling me I rock. No, dude, you rock. You guys rock. Um, on that note, I'll catch you later.